Thanks, Rich, and welcome everyone. Karen and I will be talking about metadata for library book discovery and some things that you can do to make your titles easier for library patrons to find. As an overview to the presentation, we'll start by looking at the advantage of working with libraries. Then we'll go through different aspects of library metadata requirements, how libraries currently share metadata, where your metadata fits into this, and some considerations when embarking on metadata creation for libraries. We recognize that each of you may be on a different level of understanding or experience in working with libraries, but we hope that each of you will walk away with something worthwhile. Earlier this year, Mitchell Davis, co-founder of Bibliolabs, wrote an article or post entitled, How Libraries and Patrons Can Beat Publishers at Publishing. In this article, he quotes Hugh Howey as having said, best sellers happen through readers. Readers post things on review blogs and on Goodreads, Facebook, and Twitter. They're really the ones that build buzz about good books. Howie goes on to say that indies may even embrace pirates if it means they end up on a top 10 list. To this, Mitchell responds, libraries by virtue of their trusted role in the community can be far more valuable than a pirate in the word of mouth process of exposing books to readers. Looking next to some highlights of a study pub published by Overdrive, I've included the full list of six highlights, but want to focus on two of them. 53% of ebook borrowers would consider purchasing books discovered on a library website, and 35% purchased a print or ebook after borrowing that title from the library. And finally, from an article on Digital Book World, Jeremy Greenfield highlighted that nearly a fifth of all patrons use the library to discover new content. 21% of patrons are considered power patrons. They visit the library most often. Of the power patrons, more than a third use the library to discover content. Nearly 40% purchased a book they discovered, and nearly two-thirds bought a book by an author discovered through the library. For every two books they borrow, power patrons buy one, and nearly two-thirds of power patrons buy books that they had previously borrowed at the library. I think we can all agree that there's potential amongst library patrons to sell books. So if we want to tap into that potential, what is it that libraries want? I think most of us are familiar with a typical search screen at the library. This is one of my local libraries, Orem Public, and if I wanted to look for a book at their library, I'd enter my search terms here. Let's say I wanted to find a Harry Potter book to read. When I search Harry Potter, I get this list of available titles in the library's database. I'm going to decide that I want to read the second Harry Potter. So when I click one of the Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets links, I come to this screen. I can see who the author is, who published this book, and in what year, the number of pages, and a summary of what the book is about subject headings, etc. If I had used any of this other information to search for this book, I would have found it <clears throat> in this database. This, of course, is a very patron-friendly format for viewing library metadata. What librarians really care about is this behind-the-scenes view, or the MARC bibliographic record. What is a MARC record? MARC stands for Machine Readable Cataloging. Remember the old days when you had to go to the library and use their card catalog? Or perhaps you went to the library and you saw those big shelves with drawers and cards in them and you wondered what they were? Well, the MARC format was created in the 1960s as a means of computerizing the information on those cards. It has become the means by which library systems interpret bibliographic data. In its early days, there were many flavors of MARC, US MARC, UK MARC, etc. But these formats evolved over time into the International MARC 21 standard. The link here takes you to the Library of Congress website, which lists out all of the details of that MARC 21 format. 
Now there are different kinds of MARC records, bibliographic and authority. What librarians will want from you is the bibliographic MARC record. Here's an overview of what goes into a MARC bibliographic record. Each field is designated by a three-digit number, which represents um, or signifies what information is represented there. You'll see that this information isn't really anything new to you. They want title and author information, as well as other descriptive information, such as edition, imprint, and pagination. There is also room in the MARC format for the libraries to add information that is local to them. So there is a little bit of flexibility. This is a partial example of the MARC bibliographic for the second Harry Potter we looked at earlier. You can see the three digit field or tag number on the left. Each field has also, also has two indicators which represent certain information. And within fields, there may also be subfields. Subfields are predefined for certain types of information. If you look at the 300 in this um, example, the subfield A contains pagination, while subfield B contains illustration information, and subfield C, the height measurement of the book. For the description of the book to display properly to library patrons, information needs to be where the library system will expect to find it in the MARC record. As further examples, numbers and codes in the 0xx fields are going to include such information as the unique identifier. In this case, 001 is the unique identifier for this MARC record. I should mention here that every MARC record needs to have a unique identifier to prevent MARC records from overwriting each other in a library system, which can be a real mess for libraries. You may choose something alphanumeric, such as a local identifier for your title in your database, along with a few letters of your name, or some other identification scheme. LC control numbers, ISBNs, and classification systems, such as Library of Congress or Dewey Decimal, are also entered here. Here again, you can see uh, author, title, and publication information, as well as physical description in their appropriate MARC fields. The 5XX fields include notes about this book. Here we see the names of the sequel to this book and what, the, what book it's a sequel of, as well as a summary of what the book is about. The 6XXs contain related subjects, and you'll see there are many here in this example. And the 7XX here, or the 700, lists the illustrator of this particular publication. If you're going to work with MARC records, you'll become familiar with .mrc or .mrk files. It is also possible to get MARC information in an XML format, also known as MARC XML. I believe that most library systems will accept both, though the, though the .mrc files are going to be your most common. What we won't go into detail about now is the possible future transition away from MARC records. You're all aware that there are different flavors of XML out there, including Onyx, which is prevalent in the publishing community. Well, there's real discussion going on in the library community about moving away from the clunkiness, if you will, of MARC records into a library flavor of XML. So there's certainly an understanding that library metadata format needs to join the 21st century. Having said that, MARC information will still be around for a long time. <laughs> With an understanding of the MARC format, we need to consider how librarians actually enter the data into it. This is where AACR2 and RDA come into the picture. So what are AACR2 and RDA? Some of you may have heard these terms before. In library speak, they are content standards for the description of resources and establishment of headings. But in everyday terms, both tell catalogers how to record information about a book and what information to include. AACR2 stands for Anglo-American Cataloging Rules, second edition. The most current revision is the 2002. 
The rules were first published jointly by the American and Canadian Library Associations along with SILIP in the UK. The initial version was published in 1978 as a revision to AACR, which was developed in 1967. It's gone through several revisions since 1978. RDA stands for Resource Description and Access and was meant to be a replacement for AACR2. It was published in 2010. We at Backstage were involved in some of the early testing of RDA in the latter part of 2010, but it wasn't until March 31, 2013 that the Library of Congress and other U.S. national libraries actually began creating new catalog records in RDA. Some libraries were quick to make the change as early as 2010 to RDA, while others still have yet to start. So this is still in various stages of adoption. For the purpose of a visual comparison, here's what part of an AACR2 record looks like. You can see in the 300 that there are abbreviations entered for words such as pages, illustrations, and color. Um, AACR2 has really tried to standardize usage of a variety of e abbreviations in a number of languages. This same title is here now in RDA format. You can see the differences in green. The abbreviations are spelled out now in the 300 field. There is extra information about the type of resource this is in some additional 3xx fields. In the 100 and 700 fields, those are for author and additional contributors, there are terms that describe the relationship they have to this book. So here you see we have an author of the foreword and a different one for the afterword. And we can see who had photography included in this as well. So in this sense, RDA helps us to see these relationships more clearly. I mentioned a few minutes ago that libraries are at various stages of implementation of RDA. So now is definitely a transitional period for cataloging standards, and libraries are living in a mixed environment of records. Another aspect of cataloging to consider is that of controlled vocabularies and authority control. And for this topic, I'm going to turn this over to Karen. Hey, thank you, Nicole. Hello, everyone. I'm going to be talking about how controlled vocabularies and authority control enhances the access to bibliographic materials. Even keyword searching is enhanced by using control vocabularies and authority control. In library speak, a control vocabulary is defined as a list of preferred or authorized terms. These terms can be for personal or corporate names, places, topics, codes, relater terms, on anything can be in a control vocabulary. A good vocabulary will also include variant terms and related terms. Variant terms or variant forms are the alternate terms for the entity that is being described but are, are not the terms that were chosen to be the author authorized form. These are usually called C references because they lead the searcher to see the correct term. These can be things such as former names, synonyms and alternate, ex alternate spellings, anything that also refers to the entity in the record but was not the chosen form. Related terms are other authorized terms that are related to each other, things like multiple identities, broader and narrower subject terms. These are called see also references because they are other terms that will produce search results. Each related term will have its own authority record with that term as the authorized form. When catalogers need to describe a resource, they need to choose an authorized term to use in the access point in a bibliographic record. So why is an authorized form so necessary? Maybe someday in the future, everything and in a record and all the information that we have will be so well linked together that we won't really need to choose an authorized form. But for now, the systems that we have work best with one authorized form with everything else linked to that form. For example, by choosing one authorized form of a person's name, such as Mark Twain instead of Sammy, his real name Samuel Clemens, all the materials relating to that person can be collocated together no matter how the name is used on the material. 
So works by Mark Twain will use Mark Twain in the record, but works about Mark Twain might refer to him as Samuel Clemens. Through the use of the authorized form and linking the other forms to it, there only needs to be one search made to be able to find all of that information. When the authorized term is chosen and the variant terms and other related information is determined, the information can be encoded into a machine-readable record. In the library community, we call these authority records. Each authority record represents a unique heading for an entity, such as a person, a place, subject, term, business, and so on. The most widely used format is the Mark 21 standard for authorities produced by the Library of Congress. Nicole has described the bibliographic format, and I'll just go over briefly the authority format because they are a bit different. So you can see here the fields in a Mark 21 authority format record are similar to those for a bibliographic record in that it also uses the three digit tags, it has indicators and subfields. But though you see the same numbers for the tags that are used in bibliographic records, the tags mean different things in an authority record. The OXX fields are still used for control numbers and other codes, but these will be related to authority type information rather than bibliographic. The 1XX is for the authorized heading. The three XX fields aren't for physical description, but are rather a group of fields that contain other information about the entity that's in the authority record. Four XX fields are for the C references, not series. These are for the variant forms that were not chosen as the authorized heading, and this is how they're linked to the authorized heading by putting them in these fields. 5XX fields in an authority record are for the C also headings, the related terms. That means that there will be another authority record that has that heading as a 1XX in it. 6XX fields are not subjects like they're used in a bibliographic record, but in an authority record, these are used for the sources of the information that's being put into the records. Authority records are for the headings and terms that will go into the fields in the bibliographic record that are under authority control, and we'll have more on that in a little bit. So this is a mark named title authority record for one of the Harry Potter books, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. The authorized form is in a 100 field. Now the 100 refers to a personal name, and they've used the author in this case, and then the title of the book together to create the authorized form for this title. That's the way the rules prescribe that these authorized forms should be chosen. In this case, the chosen form has, is the title of the book as it was published in Great Britain, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. As you can see in the 400 field, they've used the title of when it was published in America, Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, as a cross-reference. So no matter which way they're looking for the book, they'll be able to find it. You'll see some 5XX fields there, one for the motion picture adaptation of the work, and another one for the sequel, Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. The 3XX fields, you have 370 and 380 fields, this is providing other information that can either be displayed to the patron or be used for filtering the searches. By adding these terms to bib records, someone would be able to search for fantasy novels published in Great Britain, and this title would come up in the results. Here is a sample subject authority record in MARC. The fields mean the same thing since this is also a MARC record, but the rules for creating subject terms are different than for creating terms for names. As you can see here, if you search for Philosopher's Stone, the system will be able to know that the proper term to use is alchemy, and will still be able to find all the relevant, relevant materials. So whether whoever has, has written the book has used alchemy as their term, or the Philosopher's Stone, patrons will still be able to find all of those materials. 
Now in subjects here you can see this is a 150 tag instead of a 100 and sub that's because this is a subject and they are used 150. In MARC records, the numeric tag and the subfield codes provide part of the metadata to identify the type of the entity that's in the record. So when similar types of authority records are gathered together, they become an authority file, which is a type of controlled vocabulary. Thankfully, these days, authority files are almost always in machine-readable form. But I'll date myself by saying I can still remember working with catalog cards and creating authority files by typing cards for them. So I just say hooray for the computers. Authority files are sponsored by many different groups and encompass many different types of, of vocabularies. The Library of Congress offers numerous authority files or controlled vocabularies. They can all be searched free of charge from the library's websites. The name authority file, or NAF, and the Library of Congress subject headings, or LCSH, are probably the most widely used authority files in the library community. The NAF itself contains over 8 million authority records, and the Library of Congress is adding to the vocabularies all the time. The Library of Congress John Reform Thesaurus is in progress at this time, and so new records are, being, are going to be added periodically. And there's a new file that just came out very recently, and that's the Library of Congress Medium of Performance Terms. Here are some other authority files that are commonly used in the library community. There are files for different topics, such as art, architecture, medicine, and there are also files for types of materials, such as rare books. In bibliograph marked bibliographic records, it's possible through the use of indicators and codes in subfields to indicate which authority file a term or a heading comes from. So it's possible to use terms from different authority files in the same bibliographic record and have people know which file it is it comes from. And that helps if one vocabulary doesn't have all the terms or headings needed to describe material in the best way. The process of choosing authorized terms, maintaining and updating those terms in authority records, and using those terms in the bibliographic record access points is called authority control. This work maintains the consistency of access points in bibliographic records and shows the relationships between these access points, thus keeping the library catalog working at the peak of efficiency. So although the owner of each authority file such as the Library of Congress for the NAF and LCSH, or the National Library of Medicine for the MeSH headings, is responsible for the creation and maintenance of the actual authority records. It's up to the creators of the bibliographic records to make sure that the authorized forms are used as headings in the bibliographic access fields. This is a fairly typical bibliographic record, and I've highlighted these bi the bibliographic fields that are under authority control, meaning they should have authorized forms used in them. All the headings in these fields ha will have a corresponding authority record. So J.K. Rowling will have an authority record, and then Harry Potter, the title Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone has an authority record as we've seen. The subject fields say wizards, that will have an authority record. And there's authority record for the subdivision juvenile fiction also. By using authorized forms and access point fields in bibliographic records, links can be created from the headings in the bibliographic record to the authority records for those headings. So when an authorized form in an authority record is updated, the headings in the bibliographic records with that heading can be updated too. This will save a lot of time for the catalogers and ensure that the patron will always be able to access all the materials for the terms that they use in searching. By keeping control of the bibliographic headings, both the cataloger and the patrons are served better. Using authority control when cataloging materials has many benefits. Here are some of the most important. To link all variant forms to the authorized form, differentiate between things that have the same name, to link related terms, 
to do automatic updating and to provide filter information for filtering searches. By linking the possible search choices as variant forms or C references to the authorized form, the patron can find what they need without having to make extra searches. Most catalogs today will take the searcher seamlessly from the incorrect heading to the correct heading without them having to do anything else. In this example, Sean Combs, who's an, a rapper, is now known as Diddy. He started his with the name Puff Daddy, then changed his name to P. Diddy, and then changed it again to just Diddy. The authority record for this person was made when he was referred to as Puff Daddy, and that was the authorized form. But then the authorized form in the record was changed when he changed his name until now it's the authorized form is Diddy and his former authorized form of Pup Daddy has now become a C reference. But as we said, the cataloging, catalogs being able to link the bibliographic headings to the authority record, when that authorized heading was changed, all of the headings in the catalog could also be changed. This often is referred to as global updating. It is a way of automatically updating headings and is another big benefit of controlling the access points in bibliographic records. No matter what name the patron used to search with, no matter how he knew this person, he'll be able to find all the relevant items for this person. Another benefit is disambiguation in the catalog. Often different entities such as people, places, topics, even titles will have the same name. There needs to be some way to differentiate them so each entity has a unique authorized heading. This is especially important in keyword searching in order to filter the huge returns that can be the results of a search and help the patron to find the exact thing he wants without having to sort through numerous things that he doesn't want. This also helps to avoid mistaken identity. For example, let's take the name of Jack Purcell. This person is named Jack Purcell. This person is also named Jack Purcell. And here is another Jack Purcell. These three people all have the same name. So without a picture, how would you be able to differentiate them and know which one you were talking about? In the library community, we differentiate by adding something else to the preferred name in order to make up the authorized form of the name. For people, and often corporations, librarians will add dates. But for other types of headings, and even for these, other information may also be used. Anything that will identify that person uniquely, or that entity uniquely. Here we see that this Jack Purcell was born in 1919, died in 2003, and he was a trombonist with the Pittsburgh Society Events Orchestra. This Jack Purcell was born in 1903, died in 1991. He was a pro tennis player. He was a native of Ontario, Canada. He was a badminton champion, and he is most famous as the inventor of the Converse style athletic shoe. So he is very well known. This Jack Purcell isn't as well known. His birth date is unknown. He died in 1966. This Jack was known as the stick doctor to the local neighborhood that he called home in Ottawa, Canada. He received this name because he could be found mending hockey sticks and skates for the children in his community. He wasn't as well known as the Jack Purcell badminton champ from about 600 miles northeast of Ottawa, but he was popular for his talents at fixing broken things. In fact, the city of Ottawa named a park after him. To see why disambiguation is such a benefit, let's take a look at the sad case of the Jack Purcell Park in Ottawa. The City of Ottawa commissioned an architect to build an art fixture that would help represent Jack Purcell and his contribution to his community. The architect didn't know who Jack Purcell was or what he was being honored for. So it's assumed that the architect searched Jack Purcell in Google to see what he should base his art pieces on. Even today, if you search this name in Google, all of the results from the first page or two will reference Jack Purcell, the professional badminton player. So it's not obvious that there could be other Jack Purcells that should be considered. The fact that the search returned to Jack Purcell, who was a native of Canada, didn't help. 
At this point, the architect decided he must have the correct Jack Purcell and proceeded with developing his art pieces to reflect the badminton champion. He created several pieces and had them installed at the park in Ottawa. The problem was he got the wrong Jack Purcell and the city ended up wasting the money they had wanted for the art. As you can see, not a good representation of the stick doctor. Now this may be a rather extreme case, but differentiation is important in library catalogs also so that the patron will be able to tell which Jack Purcell he wants out of all the ones returned. Another benefit to authority control is linking related headings. Here are the most common types of related heading links that you will find in authority records. By providing these links, patrons can be led to more relevant material without having to know beforehand what else they can search for. Patrons can easily broaden or narrow their search with just a click. So in our authority record for Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, we can see the links to the motion picture adaptation and also to the sequel. So by linking these all together, the patron will be able to see what else he might be able to find. Even the notes that are in the 5XX fields can be displayed to the patron, giving them more choices and better information to help them make their selections. Through the links of broader terms, as in this subject authority record, a patron can be guided to more and more relevant materials. Or they can use narrower terms in these same fields to guide the patron to more specific material and help them. This is very valuable for research. So all these benefits of authority controlled headings in bibliographic records lead to the biggest benefit of all and that's making the materials in the books more accessible to the patrons. Well, thank you. Now back to Nicole. Thanks Karen. Because using controlled vocabularies link information in a library catalog together I would always suggest investing some sort of amount in authority control in your marked bibliographic records. Um, I don't think any of us wants to reinvent the wheel or redo information that's already been created. Well, neither do librarians, so they fully support the sharing of metadata, especially in this day and age where librarians are expected to do more with less. There are several library databases out there from which libraries and publishers can get MARC records. This is by no means an all-inclusive list, but you'll see that there are national libraries which share their metadata with others, such as the Library of Congress, Library and Archives Canada, and Libraries Australia. There are others that are national or international cooperative databases where member libraries can upload and share metadata, such as Research Libraries UK, OCLC WorldCat, and Sky River. There are also smaller scale databases, such as those for library consortia or public library systems. Um, those aren't mentioned here. To give you an idea of how large some of these databases are, the Library of Congress contains around 14 million bibliographic mark records. And on a much larger scale, OCLC WorldCat contains nearly 329 million bibliographic records. So there's a lot of metadata sharing going on out there. With the necessary access to these databases, libraries can search for and download MARC records for titles they acquire. Some databases are subscription-based and require login information, but some of the national libraries, such as the Library of Congress, do offer free access. To access their database, it does require Z3950 connection and searching capability. But once the connection is established, you can typically perform title, author, keyword, or ISBN searches to find MARC records you need. For those of you who may have a backlist and would like 
to search for existing cataloging. Mark Edit is a free program available which offers a Z3950 connection to the Library of Congress and has the capability of searching it. And for those of you who want to delve into MARC records, there is also MARC editing capabilities in this program. And I've included the link here where you, to where you can go to download that program. The majority of you may already know about CIPs, or cataloging in publication, but I'll mention it here for those who may not. You can have your books cataloged by a librarian prior to publication. The CIP data can be printed on the title page verso, and at the time of CIP creation, it can or may also be created in MARC format and uploaded to one of the library databases. There are two types of CIPs for those who qualify. The Library of Congress can create a CIP data block and a CIP MARC record for you. If you don't qualify for the LC program, you can have a cataloging vendor create a publisher's CIP or PCIP. The real benefit of this is primarily the sharing of the MARC record. The book is cataloged pre-publication and the MARC record is loaded to a database. Libraries who purchase the book can access the MARC record quickly and load it into their individual system, which means they can put it on their shelf or make it available online sooner and the patrons that are anxiously awaiting that book can find it and check it out. Having the CIP created can really speed up the time that a book gets to the patron. Without an available MARC record, it could take weeks or even months in some cases for a book to reach the shelf. That's more time that you're waiting for the book to sell. If you do get a CIP MARC record, these can be updated after publication if the title or subtitle changes slightly or if your publication year changes. So these aren't, you know, these aren't set in stone by any means. What about the metadata that publishers and authors already have? Where does that fit in? Many of you may already use Onyx as the communication format for your metadata to your distributors, retailers, etc. If you don't use it, you may have at least heard of it. Your existing metadata can be used to create MARC records. There are several crosswalks available online that can be used to map Onyx fields to MARC 21. And these are available for both Onyx 2.1 and 3.0. The Library of Congress includes on their site a link to their Onyx to Mark XML style sheet, and you'll see that link included here. So you don't need to give up what metadata you already have in your Onyx and try to start from scratch with libraries. If you keep your metadata in other formats, such as spreadsheets or access databases, there may be a cataloging vendor that has programming in place to convert those into Mark format as well. You may use BISET codes. Not many libraries use BISET codes for classifying their library, but it is good for a general start and there are provisions for including these in MARC records. You can see the examples here of the 072 field for the BISEC code, which I've also seen these in an 084 field, and this, the 650 with the BISEC heading. So these don't need to be completely ignored in your, in your metadata. What librarians really want is more quality metadata. I've mentioned already that the sooner the library can get a MARC record loaded into their system, the sooner they can put your book on the shelf. Any quality of MARC record is often better than no MARC record at all, so some librarians will still thank you for a short, minimal record such as this, typo and all, but if you can give them nice, rich metadata like this, then you've taken a step in the right direction and your title will have a greater likelihood of being found. What are some considerations to keep in mind as you embark into the library world? Richer metadata may come at a cost, so know what your budget is. The cost may be money if you decide to outsource your cataloging to a vendor 
or you may need to invest in training for a staff member to learn about library metadata. It may cost you in time because you need to chase down so-and-so to get this bit of data and so-and-so to get the other, and then you still have to compile it. So really, time is money too. How can you utilize your current metadata in its format? Can it be converted to MARC records? Or do you have information that could be added to existing MARC records to further enrich it? If you have backlist titles, how can you take advantage of existing MARC records? Which databases will you search? The Library of Congress is probably going to be the easiest database to include. Other databases, such as OCLC's WorldCat, require special subscriptions, so you'll need to work out the access to those before you embark on this. How will you distribute your MARC records? Will they come singly as each book is purchased? Will they come as a package for corresponding packages of ebooks? Are you going to send them via email or FTP? Or will you post files on your website to, for download? There are lots of different options there. How often will you need MARC records created? Based on how many titles you publish, this may be weekly, monthly, quarterly, or annually. If you're an author, it may be best to get a CAP with its corresponding MARC record since you may only publish one book at a time. Do you publish specialized subjects that may need specialized subject headings? If you're a medical publisher, for instance, you may have libraries that will want you to include medical subject headings or MeSH. And will you upload your records to a cooperative database such as WorldCat, for example? Here too, you'll need, you may need a subscription, but you could also use a database as a means of distributing your MARC records. Some tools that are available, I've already mentioned that MARC Edit is a freely available program for MARC searching or editing. The Library of Congress website also offers loads of information about the MARC 21 format, RDA, etc. For those of you that really want to get into the nitty gritty of MARC records and library cataloging. If you need to find authorized headings for your bibliographic records, the Library of Congress has their subject headings and name headings freely available on their authorities page. The National Library of Medicine has a similar page for their medical subject headings. And if you need to look at adding library classification, these are both subscription based, but you can look into either the Library of Congress classification or Dewey Decimal. And I can tell you that public libraries are going to mostly prefer Dewey, while academic libraries are going to mostly prefer Library of Congress. So basically, no one knows your content like you do. So take control of your library metadata. You can play a great role in helping librarians to find and promote it. Thank you. Well, thank you, Nicole and Karen. Uh, that's a lot of really great information. Um, and I think there's a lot to dive into. So we have about 15 minutes left. And it would be great to do a short question and answer and, and dig into some of the questions uh, that have come through with the audience. If, if possible, let's take a quick uh, zoom out um, to get started. And, uh, and then we can dive into some of the nitty gritty. Um, when, when publishers and even authors are, are crafting metadata for libraries, um, it can sort of seem like a lot to keep track of. Um, what do you suggest just as far as, you know, laying the groundwork um, as far as creating metadata um, on an economic, like an, an economical basis that A, doesn't require very many um, resources and is minimizes the time investment. Um, I guess another way to phrase this, somebody has asked, like, what are the very fundamental principles that underlie uh, MARC records, for example? Well, that's a great question. Um, it's a big question, so we can it is. <laughs> segment it out. <laughs> okay. Um, I think to make something like this economical, you're going to want to utilize the metadata that you already have. So you're going to want to look at how, you, how can you convert 
what you have in Tamarack Records. Um, you'll also want to utilize the library databases, um, especially if you're you know, if your titles are older that you're looking at getting MARC records for, chances are if it's, you know, more than a year old, there's probably going to be something out there. And so it's going to save money just to try and, and find something that's already out there. Um, sure. I'm trying to think of what let's, else. Let's, let's turn this on its head from the user's point of view. Are there ways that, you know, Somebody's familiar, you're really familiar with your content. What are some ways that you can anticipate, you know, say the terms that a user will enter in a search at a library that's specific to, you know, a reader who is in the role of a library patron at the time? <laughs> well, for <laughs> Thornton, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, there's vocabularies, you know, for different kinds of headings and that and so if you know you've got material that's in a specific um, subject area or that making sure that you've got the right terms for that particular area in there that will help the patron find it. Um, a lot of times you know most of these databases are out there just to search to find find the terms. Sure. Um, I think they utilize too um, a lot of keyword searching, mm -hmm. um, and some of that, as Karen kind of described in the presentation, can be linked to the authorized form that may appear in the MARC record. Sure. But I think um, I mentioned kind of the moving away from MARC format into an XML based. Um, that's really going to be, I think, where we see a lot of benefit of keyword searching because it's going to make um, the data more available on, say, a Google search. So someone who might be looking for a book, type it in Google, and it might pull up where they could find it, like what library they could find it at. So if they sure. don't want to purchase it yet, it will lead them there. So, mm -hmm. sure. yeah, most, yeah, most libraries in the catalogs um, will have links to other places to search, especially nowadays, the beauty of computers in your libraries, they connect into things like Google, WorldCat, other places where patrons can search. And uh, so once they kind of get, use a search term to get into a subject area that they're looking at, then all the other metadata that's in those records is what's going to help them refine that information to find exactly what they want and make sure that they're getting the book or the resource that they're, that's actually going to help them. Right, right. Speaking of the move uh, away from Mark, can you speak a little bit more in depth about BibFrame and how you know authors uh, and publishers can anticipate that transition? Sure. Um, I think some of the transition is still up in the air. Um, the discussions about BibFrame are very preliminary. Um, for those that are interested in looking it up, um, the website is bibframe.org. Um, it's headed up by the Library of Congress, but there's just a lot of unknowns still. The, the Library of Congress have been have been working on conversion programs to actually that will actually f convert existing MARC records into a bibframe format um, type of XML. So it's it's hard to say right now um, how that's going to affect publishers because I think libraries are still unsure of how it, exactly it will affect them. They're finding BibFrame is hopefully what they're looking are hoping for with BibFrame is a step into that fully linked um, world that they're hoping for where everything is linked together and to make things a lot easier. One of the problems they're finding is a lot of the metadata this rich metadata for um, resources isn't always easy to define and to put into a linked data environment. They're still working out some of the details. And as they do that, though, they'll keep refining those conversion programs that will be able to take all this rich data and then put it into this fully linked format. Sure. 
Um, going back to MARC records for a second, and, and now we're going to get, I guess, a little bit more technical. Um, one attendee has asked, are there are authority MARC records available for use as ontologies, like OWL, uh, for semantic mapping of content? I'm not really sure exactly how um, the Library of Congress are available in that sense. I'm not <laughs> as familiar with things like OWL. Sure. And that I'm, but as you, the ones that are freely available in the name authority and at least for searching subject authority, I would imagine you could take those and put them into ontologies sure. and create ontologies from them using, um, I mean, depending on what you want in your ontology, sometimes the tags themselves can be a key to being able to pull out like all of the geographic headings or all of um, topical headings and things like that, or even subfields can be used to pull out um, things that could go into an ontology. Sure. So it sounds like some of the challenge actually um, on all sides is getting, you know, different systems and, you know, methods of, of cataloging to speak to one another. Um, somebody has asked, we're looking at using, um, pardon me, we're looking at using our metadata both for internal discovery as well as for customer use, and I'm assuming this comes from a publisher. Are there best practices for doing this? And I, I know that you've covered, you know, that particular question in a variety of different ways, but, you know, for, again, I guess for publishers who, you know, are looking at maximizing the kind of attention and resources they devote, um, how do you sort of toggle between, you know, your own internal uh, record keeping and, you know, where your content plays out, uh, you know, out in the marketplace? That's a very good question. <laughs> um, and I don't know if, um, if different publishers handle it differently. Sure. Um, I imagine I don't know, there must be some sort of maybe internal tracking system that you can um, use to coordinate the data. Oh, that on the system. Mm -hmm. And yeah, what Karen kind of... A lot of it depends on the system that you're right. using. Some separate out their discovery layer from, at least I know in catalogs, they'll separate out the discovery layer from the actual inner workings of the catalog, but others are more linked together, so I think it kind of would depend on what kind of a system you have set up right. as to how those things would be able to interact. How would you recommend publishers go about determining which systems are most advantageous for their needs? I know, you know some publishers use some systems and not others, um, so what should publishers do who, you know, only are using system A as opposed to system B, and, you know, what's your, your advice on that count? <laughs> um, research out the possibilities, I think. Because um, sure. I think on a library standpoint, I mean, it doesn't necessarily matter what, what system the publisher is using. Um, so it might just come down to what's the most efficient for the publisher to use to, you know, sort of play around with their metadata or right. um, tracking it and, and figuring out what they want to push into the library world and what they don't. There are so many systems available um, to use, you know, on the computer, so many programs, so many systems. There's specific um, ILS, you know, integrated library systems that deal with cataloging um, circulation and that, but then there's also a lot of just general search type and um, management type systems. I would think that a publisher just needs to determine exactly what kind of features they need, what kind of tracking they want to do, and how they want those to interact, and just research the systems to find one that's going to have the features that they want and they need. Sure. And hopefully it's very um, similar to a library system so things can be transferred across really easy. What about metadata for some of the more um, you know, innovative multimedia formats that we're seeing on the market more recently, for example, ebooks with video or you know, um, even fixed layout ebooks with enhanced content, you know, children's titles. Are there metadata best practices for those kinds of things in particular? Yes, there, there are. And they're, you know, all basically going to have a MARC format. And 
the rules for a description are going to tell a librarian to add in you know specific information that might relate to the video that's you know within the ebook or um, you know there might be special terms for the children's books that need to be included um, you know librarians know the the different types of of materials that are out there and so they've got they've got something for everything that will relate it into a mark record for their system so it's I mean, some of that gets pretty technical, and um, <laughs> you know, but but it's definitely out there. And any any anyone who can, who offers cataloging services or you know, Library of Congress, they they'll know how to um, how to best put that information into a mark record. And many groups that um, like the Music Library Association or the Law Library Association, you know, that deal with particular areas, usually will try and create best practices. And these are really coming out, especially rare book catalog, and they'll have best practices that will tell them how best to record this information so it can be consistent. Uh, here's another question from an attendee. Would you recommend a combination of listing metadata on an information tab on a book page plus a downloadable MARC file? Um, and if so, or if not, is there anything else that publishers should consider listing um, specifically on the book page? Um, I think it would be um, beneficial to have both on the Verso and, and as a MARC record, um, like a machine or whatever, um, digital MARC record. Um, for this reason, if for some reason the mark record doesn't make it into a database, the mark record is essentially printed on the on the verso of the book, and so if so, it will make it a lot easier for the librarian to just key in that data um, into a mark record than having to try to find the correct subject heading that fits the book and and add a classification to it. Um, so I think there's definitely there's definitely benefit of having both. Sure. And then we both there. Okay. And then we've got one last question on sort of the technical side um, right before we wrap up. Do the crosswalks between Onyx and MARC records translate the BISAC codes automatically or do they have to be regenerated either manually uh, on somebody's end? Um, the BISAC codes should transfer over into the MARC record. Um, I think there might need to be an extra step if you want the code converted to the actual heading. Uh, that might require a separate um, conversion tool, but the crosswalks will at least retain that information. Got it. Great. Well, we're just about at 1 p.m. Uh, Eastern, so unfortunately that's about all the time that we have this afternoon. Um, I'd like to thank Nicole and Karen for taking the time to share their expertise, uh, as well as Backstage Library Works for sponsoring today's webcast. Um, there's been a lot of great information, and I really hope it was helpful. Um, and of course, a big thank you as well to our attendees for joining us this afternoon. Um, as I mentioned previously, you will receive a link to a recording of the webcast in just a few days uh, from GoToWebinar. So thank you again for joining us, and have a great day.